Okay, so to kick off the first session, um, we have several keynote addresses uh, and an overview of the Hydro GNSS mission. The chairs for this session are myself uh, and uh, John Pascal. John Pascal, would you care to introduce yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, Ben. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy to uh, actually co-chair with you this, uh, this uh, first session of the first uh, Hydro GNSS uh, science workshop. I think it's a real opportunity. Uh, uh, in order to catch up a bit with time, I'll just make a quick introduction and then we go directly to the first presentation. So I'm, I, uh, I'm actually the, the ESA SCALP project manager and I'm dealing with the implementation phase of the two SCALP missions uh, currently selected by ESA. We have CubeMap and uh, uh, Hydro GNSS, and I'm in, in place since the 1st of June uh, 2021. I've got more than uh, 27 years experience in space business, uh, been working with ESA since 2003 in a range of roles, uh, starting as a control systems uh, engineer in the technical directorate. Then I moved to the, tech, the telecom directorate as the EDRS uh, spacecraft manager before joining the Earth Exploration uh, uh, Earth Observation Directorate in, in my uh, current position. I've got the experience in a wide uh, range of missions uh, covering science like Euclid, the Plateau, Earth Observation, uh, ERS-2 and VSAT, COMSAT-2 ALS, MTG, COSAT, SCOUT uh, missions now, and also telecommunications, uh, EDRS, AC and uh, expansion. And before joining uh, ESA, I, uh, I worked in uh, Airbus uh, Defense and Space in Toulouse. Uh, I think it was still called the Matra Espace uh, at that point in time. And uh, with, with this introduction, I would uh, suggest we, uh, we go to the first um, uh, presentation. I would invite the first speaker to uh, to uh, to start. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, the first speaker is uh, Maurice Borgo, uh, the head of uh, science applications and climate at the European Space Agency. Mr. Borgo, uh, I would like to invite you to take the floor. Yes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Fantastic. you just, just perfectly. Good morning to all. Thank you to you, Ben and, and, and Jean Pascal. Here, it's a great pleasure to be today with you. Of course, I would have preferred to be uh, in the same meet meeting room here, but at least we can meet remotely. And I hope we will have very soon the pleasure to meet all in the same per in the same room here. I'd like also to thank uh, SSTL and, of course, the HydroGNSS team to, to host this, this event. And it's a great pleasure, as I said, to be here. Together with uh, Dominique Giron, we will present uh, the, the science you know, aspect from, from the ESA point of view, but also the implementation aspect uh, linked to the HydroGNSS. So if you could show my first slides, please. Fantastic. So we'll share this presentation uh, with my colleague Dominique, head of the uh, or manager for the Earth Explorer programs, but also from the Scouts and myself. If you could go to the next slides, please. And uh, the idea here on slide number two is to recall the idea behind the, the Scouts here, the program we started a, a few years ago. Just waiting for the next slide. Perfect. Okay. Um, when we looked, this was a discussion with some member states here back in uh, 2018, 2019 here, to look at you know what we could do. We were of course looking at what was happening in in the new space and the impact on our activities here. And I like to, um, it's difficult to have a definition of new space, but it's not only about new companies, investors and commercials, but what could be done in the frame of, of science here. And the idea here was, or so where the, the, the key drivers for scout missions is, I would say more at the programmatic level. So we said, okay, we saw member states, this was an agreement, 30 million uh, cap cost and a launch within three years after the kickoff here. And then, you know, what can type, what type of, of science can be achieved within this, these boundary conditions? We didn't place a call here. We had some, uh, it was an ITT, we started this, um, and then we had quite a lot of interest. There were some initial activities for 
the best uh, proposal that were sent to us. And at the end, uh, two missions were retained, uh, QMAP here, and of course, HydroGNSS, that's the one that we are talking today here. Uh, as you see, both, you know, the launch here, what we do expect is before the end of 24, which is, you know, within the three years, as I mentioned earlier here. Just want to recall that uh, the scouts are not about Earth Explorer, you know, the, the large science mission or the Copernicus mission here, but we see quite a, a potential for the scout mission without these programmatic uh, boundaries here to achieve, you know, uh, quite a few things, including uh, new science uh, achievements. And I think that's one of the goal of, of today, today's meeting. If you could go next, please. Okay, it's about uh, GNSS reflectometry here. And, you know, there has been quite a lot of heritage here at ESA, but also at national level here in, in the UK, but in many of our member states, and of course, in, in the US here. It's to use, you know, the signal of opportunity from uh, might it be GPS, might it be GLONASS or Galileo or Baidu here, looking at the uh, reflected signal here and from, you know, uh, smaller satellites here um, with a receiver here to look at the reflected signal here. Um, we started, as I said, uh, 30 years ago, at least at ESA in, in this, um, you know, looking at this and, you know, Ma Manuel uh, Martineja is present today. There was the, the concept of the Paris, uh, you know, I'm looking here at the date of 1993, but there were quite a few other uh, ideas here. We were looking in the frame of uh, the uh, Earth Explorer here. There was a proposal called GROS ISS, you know, to have a reflectometer on, uh, on the ISS or Aurora. Of course, in the UK, you had the example of the tech demo sat here and uh, other satellites here. Uh, recently, we use in the frame of a small satellite, FSCAT here in 2020, also this, uh, this technology. And of course, the American NASA uh, with Cygnus here, the constellation which started in 2017. There are quite a few uh, applications here. Some of them are mentioned from soil moisture vegetation. I'll, I'll come back to this. But we are also looking on, uh, thanks to um, uh, TechnoDemosat and other FSCAT here in terms of cryosphere, but also, you know, some uh, potential uh, promising application looking at ocean altimetry. Next, please. Okay, the, uh, you know, for sure, you know, things that we, you know, we can observe using the, uh, the reflectometry from the, from the GNSS signal here. There are a few applications, uh, soil moisture, forest biomass, uh, inundation, wetlands, and soil freeze thaw. And every time here, I, you know, try to show the match between, I would say, the regular uh, system here. We were talking of, of SMAP here. You see Australia for soil moisture, the difference between, uh, you know, the SMAP measurements, but also GNSS. Uh, similar here for uh, over the Amazon in terms of, of wetlands and inundations here, but also uh, looking at, you know, the above ground mass AGB here, which can be, uh, which can be observed here. This was an example with, uh, with Cygnus here. But really, the, the, and it's the beauty, and it's about the satellite here. The satellite observe all the time here, and we will be able to cover all the different regions of the, of the world here using and looking at different types of applications. Next, please. Uh, the, okay, this is part of the, the slides that we, we got when the, the mission was, was evaluated here from the, um, from the Hydro GNSS. Here you have a picture of the, of the team here. And uh, I really would like to acknowledge all the work that has been done up, up to now. The uh, one of the, you know, of course, science was not the key driver. As I said, it's really on the programmatic issues. But nevertheless, uh, I believe quite a lot of science will be achieved by, by the scouts here. I mentioned in terms of climate here, the ECVs, essential climate variables here, and four will be, will be monitored here in terms of soil moisture, the uh, inundation wetlands, freeze-thaw state, and, 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 and the biomass here. 
And of course, you know, in terms of, you know, overview, but I'm sure this will be detailed uh, later here during, during the two, two days of the, of the meeting here, how the signal is used here, the, uh, using the, um, the L-band, um, hence quite, you know, a way, a large uh, wavelengths in order to do the, the penetrations here in different media here. But also what was a request um, for this scout mission since we wanted to have, you know, uh, development in, in, four, in, four, in, in three years is to have what we call the um, SRL or science readiness level at the level of at least at four, you know, where, you know, some, um, uh, some measurements and some demonstration needed to, to be made. Of course, um, uh, hydrogen SS uh, will fill uh, a gap here, uh, you, you know, SMAS, so we launched in 2010, uh, SMAP was launched by, by the Americans. What is coming in the near future uh, with the Copernicus uh, expansion mission in terms of Simon Rose L here, but the, these missions will come uh, at the earliest, what, 2028, uh, and there will be a gap here, which will nicely be fit by um, by hydrogenss uh, towards the end of 24 here next please um, again here i don't want to um, to go again in the details here again i'm, I'm looking at the uh, the g cost um, uh, the um, um, essential climate variables here linked, linked to, to permafrost or biomass or soil motion wetlands here just to illustrate the, um, uh, the, the principle of, of the me measurements here. And just to let you know that, you know, this uh, GCOS ECVs here were not determined by, by ESA, of course, but, uh, you know, by the, uh, by the science, by the user community here from, from GCOS here. And I'm delighted to see that, you know, hydrogen SS will contribute to, to, to four of them from permafrost, biomass, soil moisture, and wetlands, as I said. Next, please. Now, what's interesting also in hydrogen SS, it's the, the combination of new, new technology and new measurements here. Of course, it's, it's L-band using, uh, you know, GNSS type of signal, it might be GPS or Galileo, as I said here. But there will be also some, some interesting, uh, you know, new ways of doing, uh, obtaining the science results. And here in the in this triangle, I try you know for the different type of applications here, wetlands, soil motion, vegetation, to make a split between uh, the separation by coherence or separation by by polarization. And by the way, all all of this was is is proposed by uh, by the hydrogenesis team here. And you see a few first here in terms of measurements that the uh, that hydrogenesis will be able to do in terms of the incurrent delay Doppler maps here, in terms of polarization, in terms of co coherence, and then of course to look not only at the L1 uh, frequency, but also at uh, other frequency which are available for, from GNSS, especially L5 and, and um, E5. Next please. I, <coughs> of course, I mentioned this, uh, the, the main objectives in terms of, of you know, uh, uh, forest and soil moisture, but it's also, also interesting to mention that secondary dairy objectives were already listed in the frame of the proposal, looking at, uh, you know, winds, looking at sea ice here, and uh, looking at um, ice height, you, you know, concept and linked or similar to what we do in altimetry here. And you see some examples here uh, between, you know, what has been obtained uh, with uh, GNSS R type of measurements here compared to, to, to ASCAT and a, a very good, uh, a very good ma match here in terms of, you know, wind speed, but okay, as long as the wind speed is not, not too high, but I'm sure we will see many, many of those of the secondary objectives here once the mission has been launched. And I think even, uh, you know, what we see more and more in using the Earth Explorer, using the Copernicus, but other missions is the fact that the, um, the hydrogen SS data will be merged with a large quantity of other data here and will contribute to a much better understanding of, you know, our environment, especially things linked to the, the climate change. 
So at this time, I would like to close for my part, and I, I do welcome, I hope uh, Dominic is online, and he will uh, report more on the implementation of, of this mission. So Dominic, the floor is yours. Unfortunately, Dominic, uh, as far as I know, was uh, was uh, still in the uh, IPC meeting. There was, the voting is ongoing, so uh, he asked me to uh, to take over, and he, he will jump in at uh, when he can, uh, uh, when he can, as soon as he can. So, if you could, uh, Andy, go to the next slide, please. Uh, which now, I mean, the second part is linked to the uh, implementation aspects of um, of uh, hydrogen SS. Um, so hydrogen SS is a small but highly capable uh, satellite and you have here on, on the slide a, a quick description. So it's built on the SSTL21 uh, platform. Uh, it implements a three axis stabilized uh, AOCTS, uses an X-band link. Uh, it provides a 30 meter per second delta V capability. In terms of dimensions, it's uh, 45 by 45 by 70 uh, centimeters. Uh, for a launch mass of roughly 60 uh, kilograms. The payload si duty cycle is uh, is 100% and the, uh, the uh, downlink is 160 megabit per second. So now if we look a bit at the uh, at the uh, right hand side, you can see the um, you have uh, an impression uh, with the uh, four uh, deployable solar uh, panels. Uh, you can see on the Top of the uh, of a satellite of a, of a bus, the uh, avionic stack. Uh, you can see. I don't think I can show with my mouse. So okay, but anyway, you have uh, you have the descriptions. You can see the star trackers. Uh, we have uh, two star trackers. Um, and we have a TTCS band patch antenna uh, on the uh, nadir uh, side and an X band horn as well. You can see the uh, GNSSR uh, payload antenna with the uh, four patches uh, here, looking at, at the air from the uh, NEDI side as well. And if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so as already uh, mentioned by Maurice, uh, we uh, we go for a, a quick development cycle. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking now about the implementation here, really. So from a, a kickoff of the implementation phase, uh, phase B, uh, B1. Uh, we uh, we have three years before we uh, we need to to launch. So that's that's the uh, the schedule constraint. So to to ensure this, what we do is we uh, we follow a streamlined uh, DDV approach for the new units. Uh, for the un new units, we uh, perform a verification at satellite level during the environmental testing and the system end-to-end -end testing. And uh, we, we use a high TRL level at the beginning. So it's not only SRL, as uh, Maurice said, uh, also at, uh, for technology, uh, we, uh, we expect, we need actually a, a, a high uh, technical readiness level. You have a table here giving you the, uh, I mean, the details about TRL. I uh, will not go through the details. I will focus maybe a bit on the um, on the lower uh, TRL level, so TRL four, uh, which uh, uh, of course, and it's not a surprise, uh, is applies to the payload and uh, the, uh, the SGR Resi Z. Uh, we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about it, but it also applies to other uh, platform uh, elements uh, like power system, xenon tanks, structural elements, and so on. In terms of uh, schedule, you have a, uh, a representation here. Uh, so kickoff was uh, in October last uh, last year, 2021. Uh, we uh, we had the SRR. Uh, we just had the SRR uh, in January. So we go for the PDR um, this year. This uh, year, actually, the CDR will also happen in 2022, uh, and then we move we move to phase D. Uh, do the manufacturing and test, final readiness review, and then launch in 2024. Uh, and then the AOCR will uh, actually, I guess, will uh, will uh, overlap in 2025. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. OK, so in terms of uh, operations, uh, so um, uh, we have uh, six months uh, commissioning Part, which uh, which then is followed by 2.5 years of nominal uh, operation. So it's the nominal uh, duration of the mission with a potential extension of two years uh, of operations. 
so we'll follow, I mean, after launch, we'll follow the usual sequence, uh, LIOP, three weeks and uh, commissioning for platform and payload. Uh, after this, we'll have the IOCR, uh, enter the operational and experimental phase, uh, as I said, 2.5 years uh, nominally. And then uh, depending on uh, the outcome and hoping we get uh, quite good science, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we would certainly like to extend uh, the, uh, the uh, operations for two uh, more years and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, decommission the, uh, the satellites. It, it will be the end of the, uh, of the mission. In terms of, um, in terms of uh, sequence, we launch on uh, with Ariane Espace. Uh, we have the TTNC ground station in Guildford in, uh, in SSTL uh, for the telecommand and telemetry housekeeping data. Uh, mission planning is also in, uh, in, in Guildford. Uh, and then there's a data processing facility which will uh, collect the, uh, the measurements uh, coming from the payload. Uh, and as you uh, undoubtedly know, I mean, we'll be measuring the uh, reflected uh, GNSS signals to, uh, to, uh, to get uh, level 1B, level 2 uh, products for, for science uh, users. Next slide, please, Andy. Okay, in, uh, a few more details in terms of the uh, current implementation uh, status. We, um, we uh, so as I said, we kicked off in October last year, and uh, then we prepared for the uh, the SRR, and we uh, we passed uh, this important important milestone with a board, a successful board on the 13th of uh, January. And this review, this uh, system requirements review was the first uh, scout review uh, run. And it was implemented and that's, uh, that's a change also to, uh, to, um, to implement the uh, agile and uh, new space approach. It was implemented as a project level review. Uh, meaning that we uh, did not involve independent uh, reviewers as we would typically do on other uh, missions. Uh, so we, we made it at uh, project level, essentially. But still, it, uh, it, uh, it enabled to uh, identify relevant issues. And we managed to put uh, agreements in place. So, uh, and this approach uh, proved to be very successful and efficient. And this was rec recognized by all stakeholders. Uh, uh, SST Alisa. So this is uh, this is uh, the first success, I would say. And then uh, uh, immediately following the uh, the SRR, uh, we uh, we went to KPGR one. So that's so KPGR is Key Performance Gate uh, Review. Uh, we have a series of these uh, of these. Uh, 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 sorry to interrupt. Dominique is connected. Uh, he cannot talk. So maybe someone needs to uh, to give him the right. To, uh, to talk, and then I think he will just uh, nicely take over here. And while we're waiting, so I'll just finish this, uh, this part. So the KPGR1 uh, was passed on the 20th of January, and this was uh, exactly as per plan uh, after kickoff. So the, uh, this is a very good uh, start for, for hydrogenesis, very promising. And we managed to, uh, to, um, to confirm that we have a robust and credible, credible plan uh, till uh, September where we need to have TRL-6 uh, uh, achieved. Um, in general, activities uh, progress nominally. Uh, the launch date in uh, last quarter of 2024 is, uh, is maintained and we have relevant schedule margins. Uh, on top of that, uh, we have a, uh, a SAG, a Science Advisory Group, uh, set up and active uh, with three meetings uh, held so far. The next meeting is actually uh, later today after the, uh, the workshop. Uh, and currently activities focus on the end-to-end -end simulator activities and to ensure SRL5 at, uh, at PDR. Concerning the launch, uh, the launch of this contract is under finalization with our Espace to secure the launch date. Is Dominique uh, able to talk now? I, I believe he should be able to. Uh, he's been promoted. Yes, at uh, last. Can you uh, hear me? Perfect. Yes, yes. Dominique. So, um, so I'm deeply sorry and deeply apologize for, for being late. I was not uh, controlling my uh, 
was not able to control my uh, agenda this morning and I have to, to step for my uh, bosses for an important meeting. Uh, but I'm uh, very pleased I could make it at the very end of uh, this uh, introduction. So I'm Dominique Gilleron and the Earth Explorer uh, Program uh, Manager and Scout is uh, definitely one of the new type of projects in the, in the perimeter. I'm working for ISA in the Earth Observation uh, Directorate. And I'm very, very proud of uh, the Scott project, uh, as you have seen uh, presented both by uh, Maurice and uh, Jean Pascal, the, the project manager working uh, with me uh, for, for this project. It's a new kind of uh, vehicle for us to go uh, quickly in orbit uh, without compromise on the level of uh, science and taking advantage of uh, the, the, the new space approach so uh, meaning accepting to take more risk accepting uh, to follow up much more industrial standard than uh, trying to apply uh, our uh, well tested and well known ISA standard so it's a bit uh, a new journey and a new road uh, with us and uh, the, the journey in, in, in which we are, we are now uh, working together with uh, the industry, so namely SSTL and all the, the science community, it's, uh, it's a learning curve for everyone. Uh, for ISA as well, uh, it's, it's really the, the first scout uh, moving forward. We have a second one just started uh, a month later and uh, that's very important that uh, we, we draw lessons. And uh, I see a huge potential of uh, this mission to really go fast, test an ID, and uh, then later on either scale up this ID for an operational mission. So for example, we can uh, really uh, think about having a constellation of uh, this uh, micro satellite to have uh, the right revisit and uh, the, the right uh, time uh, uh, time resolution uh, for following uh, much more dynamic uh, processes, uh, but also to scale up uh, going from a, a microsat to a larger satellite uh, if we want to improve uh, some of the some of the science uh, developed, and it will make the next proposal to go for uh, a much more operational uh, system uh easier by a demonstration in orbit so uh, i i think uh it's really an excellent type of project and i thank uh the, the scientific community and sstl to have believed in that investing a lot in proposing this uh, uh this project and uh, you can be sure that isa will make uh, all the effort necessary so that uh, we can fly by uh, end 2024 and demonstrate that it's a new, very powerful tool to uh, make uh, some science. Thank you. I uh, thank you very much, Dominique. Um, our next speaker is uh, Beth Greenaway. Um, Beth is the head of Earth Observation and Climate at the UK Space Agency. Uh, Beth. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. By some, by some miracle, I'm here on the call. <laughs> miracle of technology. Great. Thank you. Re brilliant to be here today. And it's, um, it's great to catch some of the uh, enthusiasm from, from ESA. Um, uh, and um, yeah, it is really, really great that this is a new type of, of um, mission. Hopefully my uh, slides will come up. Will they? Somebody slides up. Brilliant, that's looking like. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take a slightly different tack. Um, as I'm looking, um, obviously been involved with ESA for a, a long time, and I'm looking at the climate aspects um, uh, in more depth. Um, and so it's kind of powering climate action with space technology. Next slide, please. Um, thanks. So uh, we look in the, the space agency, um, we look right across from this, um, how do we create the data, new types of research and development, which is very much you know, the new instruments um, across operations, ground segment and data processing. And it's really good to see on your uh, slide, I think that uh, Jean Pascal just put up that the that operational slide and how much of that will, will be in the UK with this mission. That, that's fantastic. Um, but essentially what we're trying to do is create this seamless supply chain um, 
I don't know. <laughs> Dominic's up there again. Next slide, please. <laughs> Technology. So as I say, I'm, I've been focusing on, on COP and climate, and this is just a few highlights of, of what happened there. And I think it's so, so powerful that we can bring um, satellite data right to, to the users who are really debating you know, the, the impact of, of change. I think that the debate has clearly moved on from, um, is the climate changing to what do we do about it? And so where hydrogen SS fits in is very much in the measuring uh, those impacts, um, measuring how the, the planet is changing. Um, and it's, it's, it's so critical that we get that, that data to, to the users. Um, next slide, please. And I, I think, so I think if you click through, sorry, it's weird not to be in control of my, just I think put it all up, it's easier, thank you. Um, yeah, <laughs> So what did we achieve? There was a Glasgow Pact um, that we, we must keep the 1.5 degrees alive. Um, in order to do that, all countries must actually act. Um, just before COP in October, the UK announced its UK strategy for net zero. And so this is really, um, us, it's, not, it's not the space industry at all, but it's very much other sectors, transport, aviation, shipping, industry must act um, to reduce reduce carbon inputs. But within that strategy, it states that Earth observations, we, um, we will strive to remain at the forefront of knowledge and know-how for climate change and biodiversity impacts. It's very, very relevant to all that ESA EO does, but particularly Hydrogen SS. Um, and then we have our national space strategy and the UK Space Agency priorities. And that's out of eight priorities, um, Earth observation is, is, is one of those top eight, which is brilliant. We're working with um, the UN, UNO, UNOSA, to map um, who's acting on climate in international ways, et cetera, um, so that we can really try and work out what's, what's, what's missing internationally. And then there were other um, things around deforestation. I know we've talked about with biomass, with hydrogen SS. Um, there was a landmark pledge by over 100 leaders, leaders to end deforestation by 2030. So if we can have some real, you know, in, make real impacts by 2025. Um, again, um, the science, UK science, the geo sessions and all of this data is all contributing to that. There was also the methane pledge, perhaps slightly less relevant to this meeting today. Um, but there's also the annual reporting on climate risk. So you know, how much will industry need this data? Um, certainly things like soil moisture is very relevant for agriculture, cultural uh, insurance purposes and those sorts of things. Next slide, please. So where do we then um, take this um, and how does this relate to what we're talking about today? This slide um, I've used in other talks about climate and hydrogen SS is very squarely on, the, on there. Um, and actually what's worth saying is all the other missions on there are very much about us working very closely with, um, with ESA. I think even the only one that ESA isn't actually building is microcarb. I think you're even involved in the launch of that. <laughs> so um, I think collaborating with ESA is, is, is absolutely essential. Um, and we certainly, uh, so yeah, um, Hydrogen SS is certainly very squarely in there, the one that we're very proud of uh, with lots of uh, UK expertise to build on um, on those those critical missions that that are coming through and obviously there are others um, that we're involved with next slide please um, however it's 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 way beyond ESA I know ESA are now um, chairing the technical committee of CIOS, um for the next couple of years and that's really welcomed but really we need to work together and have this global long-term view uh, of how we measure our ECVs. And that's why it, it's so, um, it's brilliant to hear. I know later on in the next couple of days, there's um, talks about how, how this, um, the data from Hydrogen SS will, will be linked to the CCI program and the production of ECVs. That's really, really critical work. And it actually joins up to, um, to, to the bigger picture. So really it's, it's, it's brilliant that we can go right from, um, as Dominique just said, uh, using the new tools of industry Combining that with the expertise of ESA, um, and then put them into the international context for climate change action. So it's 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 um, yeah very exciting times, and to bring that to fruition in three years is is excellent. Um, I think it's the last slide. I think 
please. Next slide, please. Um, yes, yeah, so really, my conclusions were that the space assets are a unique and an invaluable tool for climate action. And, and that's really how we're shaping the narrative of any more any funding, essentially, from from a um, government perspective. It's for the climate challenge. Um, as well as supporting the space industry, but it's very much of what, why are we measure, making these measurements? What are they going to do for um, do for the economy or do for society? Um, yeah, these new missions provide new tools and insights in how to measure the planet, how it's changing, but also how the actions taken are, um, how, do, how do we monitor those actions? And just that picture I've reused again, that even just a picture can really inspire action. I think quite a lot of us that work in space forget just the power of those images. Um, and this was taken, this is um, the lady from, she is actually an indigenous um, Brazilian population and she was using the puffer fish and, and zooming in on the data that's, most of that's from the CCI program or the climate data and actually seeing what that means for her region. So that it was really, really powerful um, for that, um, that so so really what we have to do work together as space agencies um investing in the space assets um and ensure these international efforts to create long-term supply of trusted data um and i think that's where having these smaller missions um but that are don't compromise on the science is is really fundamental um obviously investing in the data management product development for real user needs and we've clearly demonstrated the, the user needs and and i think the next couple of days is really critical um, for the science cases, um, et cetera. And clearly we want to invest in the people, the space skills, the data skills and the capacity um, to do it. So, so that's great. I think our last slide, um, please. Yeah, and just uh, thank you for everyone um, listening. We have one planet and we have collaboration at all levels is the only way, only way forward. So it's hopefully the next couple of days will be a good exchange of ideas and um, expertise and uh, help the mission and help the help the planet thank you thank you very much beth um hopefully we'll see lots of collaboration over the next couple of days um uh, our next speaker is sir martin sweeting uh chairman of surrey satellite technology uh, Sir Martin. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ben. Yes, uh, Executive Chair of uh, uh, SSTL, but also Chairman of the Surrey Space Centre. And also, just to keep me busy, I also the uh, Director of the UK Hub for uh, Space Robotics and Autonomous Systems. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And in the spirit of the programme, I'm going to live dangerously and share my screen and operate my presentation from, uh, uh, from here, hopefully. Uh, which, uh, of course, always uh, uh, is uh, an interesting challenge. So I shall endeavour to do that uh, now. So let me just go to share screen. And with a bit of luck, it will all spring, spring to life, I hope. So, um, Ben, I could do with some feedback. Are you seeing the full screen? I am not yet seeing the full screen. Okay. I can see your, I can see you. Yep. How's that? Mm, no, I still can't see your screen, unfortunately. Right, let me see, it says share screen. Share. Aha, uh -huh. uh, Martin Sweeting has started screen sharing and now, now I can see your, your screen has come up. Okay, and you have the full, uh, the full presentation? I have the full presentation. Um, we, have, we have the presenter view though. Okay, Rather so than full screen. Yeah, I know it's always let me just uh, swap uh, presenter. Hopefully that should do it. Oh, you're a better driver than I am. Right. Okay. Okay. So, 
A very good morning to everybody and uh, let me just uh, uh, give a, a quick perspective from the industrial partner to this uh, exciting uh, program um, and introduce Surrey Satellite Technology to you very, very briefly. Uh, we are, we like to think of as the pioneers of the small satellite uh, revolution. Uh, we are a space uh, mission prime, we are a manufacturer and operator of small satellites and constellations, but we also provide on-the-job training and we are a supplier to governments and commercial operators. Uh, SSTL has been around since uh, it was established in 1985 and we're based in the UK, uh, but we have space missions partners worldwide and uh, uh, we are an Airbus Defence and Space uh, company. Um, <clears throat> SSTL manufactures 71 small satellites, a uh, very wide range of sizes from nano satellites at three kilos up to mini satellites at uh, over 600 kilos. Uh, and of course, Hydro GNSS are sort of sitting in the middle of that. Uh, we've manufactured these spacecraft for some 20 countries, uh, eight spacecrafts for defense customers, and of course, in addition to all of that, the 34 Galileo payloads for the European Space Agency uh, and the, the uh, full operational constellation for Galileo, which we are very, very pleased to have contributed to. We've uh, completed 21 uh, hands-on training programs for various international customers, so we have very intimate programs with our, our partners uh, worldwide, and conducted 40 launches on 12 different launch vehicles across nine launch sites, so quite uh, a wide range of uh, launch experience. But not only that, we've also installed 31 ground stations worldwide to support the uh, operational networks of the satellites. Um, Focusing on Earth observation related uh, uh, missions, we've uh, launched and operated six high resolution EO, uh, optical EO satellites and uh, uh, one uh, uh, synthetic aperture radar spacecraft. And we've got another one in, uh, op uh, in production at the moment. So we produce really focus on end to end space missions with a high degree of vertical integration. And it's this vertical integration that gives us con really close control over cost. Uh, schedule and risk, and we believe that this is really ideally suited to deliver the Hydro GNSS uh, mission because we are able to take uh, a perspective right the way across the, the chain. Uh, we've also got a lot of experience in constellations. We have uh, uh, launched and operated uh, six, seven constellations for different uh, applications from the Formosat 7 constellation to high resolution Earth observation. Uh, and as well, of course, uh, Galileo. And as was very uh, was mentioned in the in the previous talk, very briefly, there is the you know the opportunity if the success of Hydro GNSS leads to really good value science to then consider the uh, possibility of uh, future constellations. And and as I say, we're very pleased and and able to contribute to that. So we're really pleased to be working with ESA on this move into the so-called new space. Uh, and see how we can deliver these, these programs to, to uh, uh, produce really high value science to complement the, the uh, Earth Explorer missions. Um, we believe we have a very strong heritage to, to do this, and so we believe this will support the delivery of this with, with ESA. Of course, introducing so-called new space approaches is going to be a challenge, and I'm sure it is going to involve a, a two-way learning process between uh, SSTL and, uh, and, and ESA, and, and I'm sure that we will, uh, we will both uh, learn lessons along the way. Uh, but I think this is a really exciting opportunity to be able to take advantages of the, the rapid response that new space can, uh, techniques and approaches can offer to, to provide some rapid response, high value science. And so I think Hydro GNSS is really an excellent mission as uh, uh, to sort of dem prove and demonstrate these principles and, and the programmatic, programmatic approach uh, and, and to showcase the sort of high value science that can be delivered from small satellites on rapid schedules and, and, and a relatively small budget and to contribute into the larger programs uh, that uh, uh, are running alongside it. And of course, G Hydro GNSS has the opportunity to be scaled up, as was mentioned uh, in, in the previous talk, and, and to provide increasing data. Actually, uh, the Hydro GNSS is the result of something like a 20-year R&D program at Surrey, uh, starting way back in 1998 with the very first uh, attempts to re receive uh, uh, GNSSR uh, signals using one of our early experimental satellites. 
um, both within SSTL, working closely with the Surrey Space Centre through a whole range of PhDs and PhD studentships. And at least three former doctoral students of mine are presenting at this workshop. So it's really uh, good to see the, the, the 20 year program finally coming to uh, fruition. And of course, we recognize the, you know, the key external support along that pathway with the five demonstrations of Tech Demos at one supported by the UK Space Agency in, uh, very in, important and timely investments from the Centre for Earth Observation Instrumentation in the UK, and of course the international collaboration with the, the with ESA and various science partners on the Technology Demonstration Satellite Number One and the NASA Cygnus mission. So uh, it, it's been a, a long journey, and it's really good to see that it's coming to fruition. And uh, uh, of course, along the way, we've trained uh, a lot of our future space workforce, uh, which is uh, an important spin-off. So that's a very quick introduction to, uh, to SSTL and our, our role in Hydra GNSS, for which we're very, very pleased to be involved in and, and proud. And we will do our very best and hope that you will find this workshop valuable and stimulating for the program. Thank you very much. Back to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Sir Martin. Um, I would now like to introduce the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Manuel Martaniera, Principal Engineer at the European Space Agency. Hello to everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And can you see my screen? We can see your screen, yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to present to you a historical review on GNS reflectometry, as I personally lived in through. Um, my name is uh, Manuel Martin Neira, I'm working for ESA, and I'm following the science payload on hydrogenesis. And it is an honor, and I appreciate very much this invitation to give this talk today to you. Uh, 30 years backwards, around 1990, I was in GMB in a company studying multipath and shadowing effects in Hermes rendezvous and docking operations with the International Space Station. And we were concerned with multipath signals coming from the structure of the space station, uh, as you see in the center drawing, but also on diffuse scattering coming from the Earth or specular reflections that we could uh, guess that uh, it was possible and they were disturbing the relative navigation. The same year, uh, there was a consultative meeting on imaging altimeter requirements and techniques at Mula Space Science Laboratory, not far away from uh, SSTL premises in, at uh, Guildford, where the mesoscale ocean problem was uh, formulated. Um, so, if one radar altimeter could uh, sample the ocean every seven days at 400 kilometers spacing or 56 days, 50 kilometers spacing, the oceanographers wanted to have a better performance to do proper uh, sampling of the mesoscale ocean at seven days and 50 kilometers. So um, one would need uh, eight radar altimeters to do that, which was pretty expensive. Um, this meeting was in preparation of uh, the launch the following year, 91, of uh, ERS-1. The Earth Remote Sensing 1 was the first ever um, satellite launched by ESA into low Earth orbit for remote sensing. And the year after, the Tropex Poseidon altimeter was uh, also launched. One year later, 93, GPS and GLONASS were declared operational. And the big question came from my boss. I had joined ESA just uh, some four or five months uh, before um, Mario Lopriore, my boss at that time, came with this uh, big question. Um, Mario Lopriore was a very creative uh, engineer and very supportive, a great person. Uh, so he came to me and asked me, could you um, think of a way to use this GPS and GLONASS uh, accurate positioning to reduce the number of radar altimeters that uh, we need to sample the mesoscale. Um, because of my short time in ESA, I, I was uh, I, I thought uh, I, I had to be to give a, a, an answer to 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 Mario Lopriore. 
Um, so I was thinking how to do that, and I came with an unexpected answer um, where I proposed the passive reflectometry and interferometry system, PARIS. Um, so I, I thought, why not using the Genesis signals at that time from GPS and GLONASS only from a single satellite? So we save uh, eight satellites, eight radar altimeters, to do altimetry by looking at delay between the direct signals and the reflected signal. And that would allow us to sample the ocean seven days, 50 kilometers, or even better, because we had uh, many reflection points available. So um, Mario Lopriore found this idea great and worth a patent. And so uh, we prepare and, um, for this. And, uh, and we look also at uh, other applications of, of and all other signals of opportunity, like those broadcasted from TV satellites. Um, and, and we see the possibilities of, of patenting the idea in radiometry. Radiometry meant uh, soil moisture, because at that time we were starting the investigation of what became later the ESMOS mission. Uh, ocean altimetry, where we see also the potential to measure uh, wind from the waveform, uh, as uh, standard altimetry was doing at that time already. Altimetry from aircraft and studies on topography and earthquake research. Um, so this is this is one overhead uh, slide that uh, I presented at that moment. Uh, we look at prior art. Hartel had been looking at the uh, B-static SAR, um, and Kurhan had uh, an idea on angle measuring to from multipath signals to to look at the altitude of, of an aircraft. And, and later, Hall, Hall and, and Corday, um, there was, uh, we found this uh, reference uh, where they were proposing uh, the, to use the diffuse scattering uh, in the MIMA radiometer to get wind measurements. So they proposed um, measurement far away from the specular point. So none of these um, prior works uh, were threatening the, the, the pattern and, and it went through. And, and then the, the, the idea was uh, also published in the ISA journal in 93. And uh, I predicted uh, precision in the order of 60 centimeter uh, for altimetry. Um, then uh, afterwards, the idea was uh, immediately presented to the ERS-1 radar altimeter expert group. Uh, but the feedback was not uh, so encouraging. Um, they had concerns because uh, we had no bistatic model for the ocean available at that time. Uh, they were concerned on the strength of the GPS reflected signals. Would they be strong enough to do anything with them? Um, and also the poor predicted altimetry resolution according to the journal paper that uh, I, I wrote. Because at that, uh, at that moment, they, they had five centimeter precision measurements from ERS-1 altimeter and also from top Poseidon. So this was a kind of a cold shower. However, Mario Lopriore, who was very always supportive, he thought it was a good idea to start addressing those points and study the bistatic model of the ocean. And we had the first model available in the summer of 94, performed by Giovanni Picardi from the University of Rome. And other models were developed later by Tano Selfuheili, and and, the, and later the most perhaps sophisticated and, and for sure the most popular uh, from Valery Zaborodny and Alexander Voronovich in year 2000. A beam of hope came <coughs> from a publication in '94 in the Institute of Navigation meeting that the French Alpha Jet fighter uh, had locked onto a GPS reflected signal while flying over the Atlantic Ocean at more than three kilometer altitude. This flight was uh, classified, uh, happened in fact in July 91, uh, but the investigation was only published uh, then in 94. Um, so this uh, retired the concern, at least that uh, the reflected signals could be um, strong enough to make an aircraft lock onto them at 3,000 meter altitude. In November, the same year, year 94, Tom Meehan from JPL uh, visited ESTEC and um, he wanted to meet us and propose 
and because he has he had read the journal is a journal paper an in orbit demonstration of the Paris concept using the GPS MET satellite. Uh, GPS MET was the first ever radio occultation satellite uh, launched into space. And by that, by that time, it was about to be launched. It was launched in uh, December 94. And he proposed to look at reflected signals over the ocean, but also over the polar caps. In December, uh, the same year, um, Jean-Claude Aubert, uh, the one who had uh, published the reflected signal from the fighter aircraft, uh, proposed uh, to use the clean code replica. In the original Paris concept, uh, I was thinking of correlating the direct, si the direct signals with the reflected signals. So that was the interferometric processing. But in his facts, he said, uh, if you use the known CA code uh, signal, it is better to correlate the direct signal with a clean replica in memory on one hand, and on the other hand, to correlate the reflected signal with a delayed clean replica doing so you will have less noise and so this was the the birth of um, the, the the technique that is most commonly used now the use of clean replicas for the interferometric technique uh, we, we investigated it further within isa and uh, because it is more powerful to get better ranging and i have to acknowledge the work done by salvatore dadio in 2011, where he uh, properly formulated the signal and noise statistics of the interferometric technique. In 96, um, I presented the Paris concept to the Institute of Space Studies. I was invited to do so. And Antonio Rius uh, groups um, found the Paris concept interesting and worth researching. This was the first uh, European institute that came interested in, in, in the concept. And they are now involved in hydrogenesis as well as La, La Sapienza University that uh, were the first biostatic model was developed. So I'm very happy to see these two groups now in hydrogenesis. And a year later, we saw many publications of uh, many interesting and pioneering work from the um, United States. Um, Xin Chun Wu, Thomas Meehan, Larry Young presented the potential use of GPS signals as ocean altimetry observable in an ion technical meeting. Jim Garrison and Steve Katzberg um, also presented their pioneering experiments on, with GPS reflected signals. And John Labreck and George Haag um, also um, included GPS uh, reflections in their uh, GPS earth sounding strategy in Copenhagen. And, and in June um, that year, um, our colleagues in Earth Observation in INISA uh, became um, interested, more interested in, in the research of GPS reflectometry. And therefore, September the same year, we performed the first ever Genesis reflectometry experiment at ISA from a bridge in Ceylon. 98 was a decisive year um, because um, John Labreck proposed to try um, detecting a GPS reflected signal from the shuttle CSR experiment. And, and Cynthia Sufada coordinated this effort, which was uh, implemented by Steve Lowe. Steve uh, crunched data for one month uh, until getting one clear clean and powerful waveform um, of uh, the reflected signal in the raw noisy measurements that the SAR in listening mode had uh, recorded. So this was the first evidence that not only GPS reflected signals could be detected by an aircraft, but also from space. Since then, many workshops have happened. I, I would like to um, highlight uh, three along the list. One was the first European Genesis Surface Reflections uh, uh, Workshop at GFZ Potsdam in 1999. Then the one of 2012 where Jim Garrison proposed um, not only to use the Genesis signals, uh, but also uh, to include other signals of opportunity like those of TV broadcast satellites and, and 
we changed the sign on, uh, of to from minus to plus in the name of the workshops, and then the workshop we are having today and tomorrow. 2003 was um, a fantastic year for genes reflectometry um, with the lead by Martin Unwin in SSTL. Um, we had the first ever uh, genes reflectometry experiment, dedicated experiment from space. Um, when Martin was preparing this mission, he came to, to me and asked for some funding, um, but then I, I work, uh, I did some computations and, and, and realized that with the little modest gain of the antenna, uh, we would hardly see any reflected signal. So I, I was not, I didn't dare to ask internally for budget to, to support him. Uh, how, I was completely wrong. And th it is very thankful that he continued his uh, endeavor um, by flying this mission because um, not only he realized that uh, we could uh, get from with a small antenna, not, not like the one uh, of the shuttle serendipitous uh, ex experience, but with a small antenna that we could get uh, reflected signals from the ocean, but also from land and also from ice. In 2004, we had the, this terrible Indian Ocean tsunami, and in 2011, another tsunami in Japan. Um, I'm convinced that in the future we will be able to track uh, the small wave a tsunami produces in open ocean with the constellation of GNSR satellites. In 2012, um, uh, Jens Becker proposed to ESA the GIROS uh, mission on board the International Space Station, where one of the main um, elements of the mission was the ocean altimetry using raising reflections. This is an area of uh, intense research, and this was a great also um, proposal that James Baker um, um, did. However, we, we didn't manage with NISA to, to fly this uh, interesting uh, mission. And in 2012, and, and led by Chris Duff, we had uh, Cygnus, an eight satellite constellation, the first operational mission based on GNSR to monitor uh, hurricanes. So th this was another um, breakthrough in the re reflectometry. So to summarize, uh, and revisiting the 93 assessment on the Paris uh, idea, uh, we developed the bistatic model, um, the concerns on the strength of the GPS signals vanished, and the poor predicted altimetry resolution, uh, we have uh, made studies that through average in many measurements or through the use of carrier phase or why not novel ideas that may come, uh, we could do also uh, altimetry. But more importantly, uh, this growth in many applications of reflectometry other than ocean altimetry. Um, so we have in, in ESA two missions uh, on reflectometry FS SCAT that was launched uh, in 2020 and PRETTY that will be launched later this year. And uh, of course, uh, hydrogenesis. Um, you will hear through the workshop many things on hydrogenesis, uh, but I, if I have to pick up one of the main outcomes that I hope to get from hydrogenesis, is that of soil moisture at high spatial resolution. I mean, I work intensively in SMOS, and we have also SMAP and, and, and CIMAR. All these missions get a resolution in the order of um, 40 kilometers or, or, or worse, and up to now. And then getting um, high spatial resolution soil moisture is still um, missing, and, and we have an opportunity with high radiances to fill the gap. I think missions like SMOS will still be needed, because you need to do some kind of um, calibration of um, an active uh, radar-based type of mission like the hydrogenesis with a radiometer mission. But going, um, it can certainly, and I hope, uh, provide high resolution um, soil moisture in the uh, right after, after its launch. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Manuel. Um, checking the chat, I actually I can't see any questions. Uh, 
thank you very much for the presentation, which is quite extensive and shows uh, a lot about the history and the foundations on which we, we are building uh, hydrogenesis. And uh, I suggest, uh, Ben, we go to the next um, uh, presentation. Thank you again, uh, Manuel. Um, can I just remind the um, all the participants that it, it is possible to, uh, to ask questions in the uh, in the Q and A bar at uh, the bottom. Um, and now, uh, with that, I would like to uh, invite um, Martin Unwin to uh, to take the floor. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just trying to share the screen. Is that showing? Okay, we'll set the presentation up. There. That's it. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, good. Right, well, good morning, everybody. I'm going to start with the presentation and I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, Pete Garner, in a moment. So I'm Martin Unwin, and um, I'm principal GNSS engineer, and I led the bid for um, Hydro GNSS. And as um, Manuel kindly um, pointed out that I've, I've been working this for, for many years, and uh, the UK DMC was as where we got started. In fact, we had a proposal slightly before that, um, but I'll mention some of that in this presentation. So I'm uh, presenting about um, the ESA Scout Hydro GNSS. Um, I'm going to be presenting on the mission overview. And the um, new initiative, uh, so ESA Scout, we've heard a bit about that. It's a new initiative from the Earth um, Observation um, Directorate. It's small missions demonstrating science with um, hold on a minute, with a small budget and a rapid schedule. Missions are fully funded by ESA and characterized by an agile and low cost development process to prove new concepts for future ESA endeavors. And the aim is to tap into new space approach, build and launch within 36 months after kickoff with a budget of 30, less than 30 million euros. And it does accept some higher risks, use of COTS components, for example, and reuse of existing designs to achieve this. And the aim is to achieve full free and open data delivered using service-based approach. And HydroGNSS was selected as the second uh, scout mission. So a, a little bit of a history um, of the, the bid, um, that the um, scout bids, um, there was an announcement for the scout small sat challenge in spring 2019. And the first team got together at the uh, GNSS Plus R conference in Benevento in, in May 2019. Um, and so a, a small group of people got together and put together um, a concept. And we um, the proposals were submitted in 2019. And I believe there were something like 16 or 17 proposals received by ESA. Um, and these were quite substantial proposals. Hydrogen SS alone was something like 800 pages. So uh, um, it was quite a job for ESA to handle that. But um, the consolidation study was awarded to four scout concepts, and um, there was a time scale as shown. And the proposal was submitted in August 2020 and presented to um, ACIO committee in um, October 2020. Um, and the scout awards were announced. Um, there was uh, the scout one was announced in December 2020 and Scout 2 was announced uh, the following year. Um, and Hydrogen Assess was selected as the second Scout mission. So um, a brief introduction to the team. You'll, you'll be hearing from um, all these people later. Um, the, obviously, we've heard from the European Space Agency, the program initiator and customer, and you've heard from SSTL. But the science team will be introduced um, soon. So Sapienza, University of Rome, um, specializing in soil moisture and an end-to-end -end simulator. We have, have IEC, um, who's also worked on GNSS reflectometry for a long time, and they're working on the inundation and GNSS signal processing. The Finnish Meteorology Institute, looking at the freeze-thaw state, Torvagata University surface interaction simulation. IFEX CNR, um, looking at forest biomass in particular. NOC has got some long experience working with SSTL and they're looking at ocean-based calibration and wind speed and ice extent. University of Nottingham is looking at 
uh, GNSS instrumentation and signal and the Technical University of Vienna will be joining us um, later in the study to um, work on the how the data may be fused with other um, data from other satellites. And we have a science advisory group um, and the, the names are listed here. I, I won't go through them all, um, but um, I believe um, everyone's present at the workshop. And um, we are aiming towards the scientific readiness levels, SRLs, which are defined in an ESA handbook. That's part of the plan for the mission. Um, we've heard um, the, the, the background to GNSS reflectometry. Um, um, it's, it's a kind of a, a radar system. It's got more than 100 sources of, of signals in orbit now, and it's using forward scatter reflection. So that's different to normal radar. And um, it's it can be used as an altimetry or as a scatterometry concept. And we're largely working on the scatterometry basis for hydrogen SS. And our concepts go back, in fact, before year 2000, we did have a downward pointing antenna on USAT 12 with our first GNSS receiver demonstration, although that wasn't specifically for reflectometry. We did do some experimentation. And you can see that we put together a, a concept called uh, the SNAP GNSSR uh, GPS reflectometry mission at the time. And then from UKDMC, it's gone on TDS-1 um, and, and NASA Cygnus using the same instrument and DOT-1 and now Hydro GNSS. And we will hear a bit more about these missions through the, through the day. So coming back to the mission, the importance of hydrological knowledge. We'll hear more from the scientists working on this, but just as an overview, water is, is a vital resource um, for climate, weather, and life on Earth. It's, it's present in or around the land in the form of soil moisture, wetlands, and rivers, snow, and ice, and vegetation. And the World Economic Forum identifies land water-related issues as amongst the greatest challenges facing the population for the future. And all these areas of, of um, knowledge of uh, the water content are important. So soil moisture, uh, high latitude permafrost, biomass and wetlands. And models need measurements for understanding and predictions and planning for the future for enabling tackling of climate change and watching how that, um, that um, fight against climate change is helped by the measures that are taken. So for climate, um, they, people use Earth system models, and for um, the weather forecasting, they use numerical weather prediction models. And both of these need measurements as well as models. Scout HydroGNSS targets land variables, which are, they're not exactly the same as ECVs, they are linked to ECVs. And I think part of the challenge is making that final connection between the measurements we take and the ECVs themselves. Um, but they're certainly closely linked. The measurements we're targeting are closely linked to ECVs. Um, GCOST specifies 54 ECVs and, and about 60% of them can be addressed by satellite data. So the areas that we're working on are soil moisture which um, and biomass and permafrost and, and wetlands is primary source of greenhouse gases is covered by a number of ECVs as well. So we're using GNSS reflectometry and, and it helps address the shortage in some of these measurements. There's a, um, an animated video, and I apologize if this doesn't come out very well. It's available on, on YouTube if, you want, if it's a bit too stuttery, but this shows the concept of taking the measurements over the different regions, permafrost, biomass, soil moisture, and inundation, um, using reflections from GNSS satellites. So, the constellations we're targeting are GPS and Galileo satellites, which are very high altitude, about 20 to 24,000 kilometers. And our satellite, Hydrogen SS, will be in a low Earth orbit, um, 550 kilometers, and it will be looking at the reflection points and taking measurements um, in the form of delayed Doppler maps, which you can see in the bottom right here. And this is L band signal, it works in all weathers, and it works. Um, we've shown that reflections can be picked up over all surfaces over oceans, ice, and land. And the, the areas that we're targeting in particular, or, or the topics are soil moisture, um, inundation, biomass, and permafrost. 
those are the primary aims, but we also have secondary aims of measuring uh, ice extent and um, ocean wind speed. And the level one measurements can be used for other applications as well. In our original proposal, we proposed two um, satellites, which gives a coverage, repeat coverage of um, covering the globe once every 15 days. Um, because the budget was limited, um, because we were the second scout mission, we, um, our current program is based on one satellite. But there is an option for a second satellite, which um, we are um, investigating at the moment. Now, I try and move on to the next slide. Here we are. So a summary of the mission and science objectives is, is to exploit the L-band satellite navigation signals to monitor the Earth's water systems to a finer resolution and derive measurements linked to ECVs defined by the global, uh, global Climate Observing System. And these summarize our goals, which are derived from um, ECVs um, that we are trying to measure to a certain um, uncertainty for soil moisture, inundation, soil freeze thaw state, and forest biomass. And we also have objectives for the, the ocean wind speed and ice extent. We're making level two and level one um, delayed Doppler maps will be made av freely available. Timeliness is, is 31 days standard, but we also have a, a further goal of, of, of trying to be able to deliver in, in less than seven days for faster service. Coverage, we are aiming for more than 80% um, global um, coverage within 30 days. Um, on a, for a single satellite, the objectives are captured in a um, in the mission requirements document. Um, and it was mentioned about the um, the gap filler. Um, a we, I think there's a great deal of use has been made of the measurements from SMOS and SMAP, and uh, they've been very they've been revolutionary for measuring the soil moisture, as Manuel Martinera mentioned. Um, they have a resolution of somewhere between 35 and 50 kilometer measurement. Um, and, but they are large satellites um, and high budget satellites. Hydrogen SS has the opportunity to do this at a lower, um, much lower cost, smaller um, satellite. And the, um, but it does need, um, one satellite will not provide the temporal resolution. Um, two satellites will improve it. Um, eventually, we're looking forward to a constellation, but this is the starting point with Hydrogen SS. Um, the, uh, the SIMA and, and the um, ROSE-L will be coming later, but they're probably in the timescale of 2028. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand over to um, uh, the project manager at SSTL, um, Peter Garner, who will carry on talking about the implementation of hydrogen assess. Thank you, Martin, for the introduction and for the excellent uh, words in preparation for this uh, extra bit. Um, so I'm the, I'm the project manager. Um, before I talk about implementation, uh, I just want to um, talk a little bit about the um, excellent pre-contract discussions that we had with, uh, with our ESA colleagues. Um, it's been mentioned earlier um, from the presentations uh, from ESA, but we, we really found it um, very uh, valuable um, going through this process. It was four stages of dialogue prior to the contract signature, and they were very fruitful. Uh, for early alignment um, on the, on the uh, scope and the expectations for both parties. Um, dialogue phases were challenging because it was, a, it was a rapid process and there was a lot of material to, to work through together. Um, but I think both parties uh, felt the benefit of doing that. Um, and it certainly helped to um, build a, a stronger team um, prior to, to kick off the project. Um, different stages. We talked through uh, there's final evaluation in the dialogue phase one um, prior to uh, being confirmed going forward to implementation. And then there was uh, a long refresh of the costs. Dialogue phase two, we focused on service delivery requirements. 
Uh, we prepared the RFQ um, together, a uh, very collaborative, uh, collaborative way. Uh, and we scoped out the pre-contract work as well, which, which helped uh, enable uh, technology readiness to be advanced. Dialogue uh, phase three was a contractual focus uh, and preparation <coughs> for the uh, final proposal submission. Um, and uh, pre-contract work happened during the period. And then on some negotiations after submission, uh, we um, <coughs> were able to refine the, the sound uh, statement of work, and we, we tailored the uh, for insurance requirements in the ECSS to enable the best scientific return um, within the available budget and the required schedule, uh, as well as continuing um, project work, the contract work ahead of the project starting. Um, in terms of um, the implementation, uh, payload, so it's a new GNSSR instrument, uh, heavily based on our experience from TDS-1 and Cygnus missions, uh, the Nadir antennas, dual polarized and dual frequency. Um, and the instrument's compatible with uh, Galileo and GPS, uh, reconfigurable in orbit, um, and it can support the new GNSSR measurements that have been discussed earlier, uh, particularly coherent measurements, dual polarization, dual your frequency. I, I can, if it's uh, not good. Yeah. You just plug in a headset. If it's, uh, it's, uh, not so good. Can we do some that? Um, does that come online now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay no problem. Um, <clears throat> onto the platform, um, we're, we're looking at a 65 kilogram uh, microsatellite from SSTL. It's got dual redundant core avionics for a robust system. Uh, we're talking about a, a 2.5 year operational life plus a, a two year extension. Uh, we've got agile star tracker, three axis control uh, with a Xenon propulsion system uh, that will enable uh, you know, phasing for a, for a constellation uh, and station keeping, that sort of thing. Dual redundant X-band uh, downlink by Svalbard. Ground segment wise, we've got a, the, the payload data ground segment known as the PDGS. That's going to be in Guildford. That's based heavily on, on our Mervis uh, system, um, which we, we currently have in use. Um, and that's going to be used to disseminate the level one, level two data to our, our users. Uh, SSTL will be the prime here, supported by uh, science team members. All operations and all scientific data product service delivery will be conducted uh, by SSTL from Guildford through to life. Um, we've got the launch uh, and the constellation. SSTL will procure the launch uh, and uh, manage the launch campaign. And there's an option uh, for uh, an identical uh, second satellite. Uh, now, that, that will uh, help us to uh, benefit uh, the uh, dynamic geophysical processes. Um, future hydro and hydro GNSS satellites uh, can also be uh, added. Uh, onto the program, some key delivery points. Um, we kicked off in October last year. Uh, initial phase, uh, system requirements review, including uh, TRL5 demonstration. So we set up the requirements, agreed and demonstrated some of the uh, more, less mature uh, technology uh, levels uh, to help us move forward. As mentioned by our ESA colleagues, we had a very successful um, first phase, passed through KPGR1 with, with no issues into the preliminary design phase, um, where, where the design gets advanced, um, starts to be developed more. And there's also demonstration of uh, TRL6, um, uh, for some of the key developments. Um, and then into the CDR phase, which is heavily focused on the, uh, the structural qualification model, uh, the finite element model analysis uh, also occurs in this period uh, ahead of release of the structure for manufacture. Um, in parallel to all of this timeline, you have uh, avionics manufacture and test uh, and preparation for the start of AIT. Once everything's ready, we, we commence AIT. This is a spacecraft focused element. Uh, 
Uh, in parallel um, from kickoff, we have the all important end to end simulator, which, which by, um, by PDR, we, we aim to uh, demonstrate a scientific readiness level five. Uh, and then continuing through to CDR, uh, we'll, we'll make additions to the end to end simulator uh, to uh, improve uh, the capabilities. Uh, the simulator then uh, directly feeds into the capabilities of the, the PDGS element of the ground segment. Uh, so it naturally follows on uh, to start the development from that point. Um, <clears throat> and then once we're into AIT, we have uh, a build up plan for the spacecraft um, through assembly, integration, and test. Um, when the spacecraft is assembled and ready, uh, we will have uh, spacecraft environmental testing. Uh, we have vibration, uh, thermal vacuum, uh, and EMC, typical uh, highlights of that section. Uh, once the spacecraft is, is fully uh, qualified in that way, uh, environmentally, we move on to integrated system testing um, for, the, for the entire system. In parallel to this, the ground segment will be brought um, online, and that includes the PDGS uh, development and implementation to uh, scientific readiness level six. Uh, that'll include the, the use of the uh, Svalbard ground segment, the SSTL backup, uh, the Space Operations Center at Guildford, and, and the Mission Operations Center at Guildford, which includes the, the PDGS element and the uh, data dissemination areas. Um, once the spacecraft has passed uh, flight acceptance review, uh, we ship out to launch, we integrate the, the spacecraft onto the rocket, and we launch. Um, and, and the target here is to launch within 36 months of kickoff. In orbit, we perform all the, all the system commissioning and bring the ground segment online uh, and demonstrate that the whole system is ready to begin uh, operational uh, service. And then we, we carry on and perform the operational service. So to, to summarize, um, we, we believe Hydro GNSS is a, a great opportunity to exploit, exploit uh, the capabilities of small satellites to advance Earth observation science. At 30 million, uh, the mission sits somewhere between Earth explorers and typical new space missions uh, towards the lower end of that. Um, it's a fast schedule, 36 months from kickoff to launch, but well within the capability of, of SSTL and, and all our supporting uh, science partners. Um, we've got this strong science element driving through the whole program. We've got the science advisory group who, who are called on to, to oversee uh, mission uh, science decisions. Uh, we have the scientific, <coughs> scientific readiness level. Uh, they must be met uh, according to uh, certain requirements. And uh, technology readiness levels also need to be demonstrated for key reviews as shown in the timeline. Product assurance wise, uh, we're following a, a, a new space approach, uh, PA approach, and this has been tailored um, during uh, the uh, negotiation phase um, from ECSS baseline, but it, it's designed to suit the strengths of the supplier so we can deliver um, you know, deliver the, the product at the end. So um, Hydro GNSS is, is uh, effectively, it's uh, uh, an, an ability to uh, deliver um, the, uh, the best possible um, science uh, within the available schedule and the available budget. So that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, uh, Martin. Uh, before going to, to a few questions, I can certainly uh, confirm it's on either side, it's seen as, as well as a very great opportunity. Uh, that's clear. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually super proud of being part of this, uh, this uh, scout endeavor. Um, now, going to uh, questions, uh, we're running a bit late, but um, uh, we. Uh, so, first question to Martin. I hope you can hear me. Um, concerning the timeliness, it's only below seven days, uh, and the uh, the question is that does not seem very useful for uh, numerical weather predictions. Can you elaborate on that, please, Martin? I hope you heard the question. <laughs> 
We can't hear you. I cannot hear you. Sorry, doesn't work. Can you hear me? Ah, yes, it's working. Yes, now, good. Thanks. Okay. Did you hear the question? No, I didn't hear the question. So, could you repeat it, please? Yep. Um, so, the, the question is regarding the timeliness, uh, which is uh, uh, only below seven days. And the question, and it seems this is not very useful for uh, numerical weather predictions. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Um, yes, I, I think this is going to be um, one of the areas that we're working on um, with the, the project. We, we obviously have a, a budget and, uh, and time schedule for the program and to offer offer a, a service that is operational to um, the kind of um, degree that um, is useful to uh, operational weather forecast requires a kind of availability that we uh, frankly have not really costed for in such a small mission. Um, so I think it's a stepping stone towards it. The hardware capability is there, um, but it's, I think a, a lot of it will come down to how it's um, streamlined and operated. Because the um, system is flexible and reprogrammable, we have that option. Um, and so it, it's certainly an option that's open to us. It's not our highest priority. Our highest priority is to give climate-based measurements. So it's it's not um, first and foremost an operational weather forecast mission. It's first and foremost a, a climate, um, it's for taking climate measurements. Does that answer the question? Um, we've lost, lost your voice. Oh. No, my, okay, yeah, I'm back, sorry. Uh, no, yes, it answers uh, the question. Thank you very much, Martin. There's another question. Uh, what are the orbital parameters of the mission, please? Okay, the orbital parameters, um, we're going to hear more about that in the systems um, the discussion, but it's it's basically, it's a sun-synchronous orbit, 550 kilometers. You'll hear more um, in the next, uh, in, in later session, sessions. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next question is, uh, uh, is the following. What is going to happen to the satellite after the two, two years and a half uh, lifetime with potentially two years extension? Any re-entry plan? Uh, so that's the first part of the question. And then the second part, will the option for the second satellite be used? And how likely will also the other satellites be added to the constellation? Okay, so in terms of the, the lifetime, um, it's, it's um, we, we, we are going to be um, discussing that. We have um, plans in place for, uh, for de-orbiting um, responsibly. It's at, at an altitude of 550 kilometers. So we will be, um, uh, it, it, the satellites will um, before too long burn up anyway, um, and we will be passivating the satellite at the end of its mission. Um, I think we will make those decisions nearer the time. It might be possible to um, look at ways that things could be extended further, but I think for the moment we're planning on the, the two and a half years plus two year extension, then deorbit the satellite safely. Um, and the option for the second satellite, I think that's that's up in discussion at the moment. We're investigating options. And how likely the other satellites, I, I think that is that's a bigger question. I, I think there are some questions we're going to have um, later in the um, later in the workshop to discuss this because it's um, it's not clear whether this is um, uh, how uh, it's not clear yet how such a constellation could be sustained whether it's an, in, an institutional role or whether it's a commercial role. I think the, this debate will that that's going to be one of the key questions I think that will come back later in this um, workshop. So keep that question in mind. Thank you very much, Martin. Thanks for the opening as well. And that's it for questions. So I hand over to, uh, to, to Ben for the conclusion on, uh, on this session. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Jean-Pascal. Jean -Pascal, and uh, thank you to all the speakers this morning.